thing as well. Hi. So whenever you're ready, Tom, you guys are ready to go. We'll wait a few minutes. I see a lot of people funneling in. So. All right, it looks like we got most everybody. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for attending the seminar. I see quite a few visitors in the in the room, and I know we have uh, a dozen or so people on the webinar. So uh, thank you all for taking the time uh, to join us for the seminar today. Uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, to have this opportunity to be able to uh, introduce and welcome our new director, Brad Cardinelli, to the Siler and Glural family here. Um, so we're very, very excited uh, to have him uh, take over the reins of Siler and uh, bring some new energy and exciting leadership to the program. And he's going to be talking about uh, not only introducing a little bit about his own science and, uh, and background, but kind of uh, sharing with us some of his thoughts about where we've been and where we're going uh, in the program and, uh, and how we can better work together. Um, just to give you a little bit about um, Brad's background, uh, he's uh, very <laughs> well diverse in both uh, freshwater and marine uh, aquatic ecosystems. Uh, he did a master's at Michigan State and a postdoc at University of Wisconsin-Madison, so he knows the Great Lakes area quite well. Uh, and then he's also very um, accomplished in uh, marine ecosystems. He spent his first six years as an assistant professor at UC Santa Barbara before joining us at Michigan in 2011, uh, where he's now full professor. Uh, he has over 100 publications, and some of those highly uh, cited publications led to a rather impressive award from um, Thompson Reuters as having, being one of the world's most influential scientific minds based on his uh, cited, highly cited paper rankings. Um, he's a member of the AAAS and recently the Sierra Club um, presented him with a excellence in academia for his leading uh, work in promoting protection of Michigan environment. So. Um, we're very, very excited to, to have Brad join us and uh, look forward to hearing your comments. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay with this microphone? All right, good. This is going to be a little bit of a non-traditional talk. It was actually about four years ago when I first came here that I gave a regular science talk. But I have recently taken over as director of the Cooperative Institute for Limnology and Ecosystem Research, and I've literally been on the job for four weeks. And some of you probably know me, but many of you probably don't. Uh, and certainly most of you don't know what I'm thinking about doing in this new director position with the Institute. So I thought that rather than giving a normal research seminar, I would instead really uh, take this opportunity to do three things. To give you a high level introduction to myself, not necessarily the details and the weeds on uh, exactly what my research is about, uh, but rather a high-level view of the variety of things I've done and the experiences I would potentially bring as the new director. Second, I want to take some chance to reflect a little bit on the marriage between Siler and Glural and what has been successful uh, in Great Lakes research. And then I want to use that to springboard into some future anticipation of what we can continue to do well and what we can continue to build on together to do even better. Okay? So, let me start off with some introduction. I grew up in the desert of Arizona, which is the absolute antithesis of Michigan and the Great Lakes. The likelihood that I was going to become an aquatic ecologist starting out when I was born was very close to zero. Um, but despite not having any water anywhere close to me, I did have a grandfather 
who grew up extremely poor in Arkansas uh, and would go down barefoot, skipping school to go fish for his family to be able to feed them in Arkansas. And to my mom's dismay, he would very frequently come and take me out of school without her knowledge and drive me up to the reservoirs in Arizona and take me fishing. And probably because of the scarcity of this resource in Arizona, I actually really grew to love the outdoors and grew to love water simply because of my grandfather. I was the first in my family to go to college. I went to Arizona State. And I was an undirected undergrad for much of the time, but in my final year, I had the opportunity to do a research experience for undergrads with this guy, Jim Elzer, who is one of the founding fathers of ecological stoichiometry. And Jim had me work on a project where it took me up to the Trout Lake Station up in Wisconsin, the University of Notre Dame's UNDERC Research Station, uh, as well as all up and down the coast of the eastern US, where I spent a good deal of time looking at how the structure of food webs influences the cycling of nutrients, mainly nitrogen and phosphorus, throughout northern temperate lakes as well as coastal estuaries. I have a funny story, uh, again, that suggests I never should have been an aquatic ecologist. Uh, I went to the Trout Lake Station and was introduced there on Thursday. And on Saturday, two days later, I decided to go down and take a look at the boats on Trout Lake, and nobody was around. And so being from Arizona and having never driven a boat, I thought, I can do this, so I rolled down the 12-foot flat-bottom John boat. Uh, it looked like a lawnmower engine. I just pulled the cord, started it, and went out to Trout Lake. Now, Trout Lake's a fairly large lake. One thing I didn't realize is that you need a drain plug for the boat. I had never driven one, so I immediately started saying that the boat is sinking, but as long as I kept going, it was taking the water out. Um, I also didn't realize in my first experience that for outboard motors, you actually need a gas can, and those were stored in the shed. Um, and I hadn't gotten one. And so I found myself in the middle of Trout Lake sinking a boat that was out of gas. Um, and I just thought to myself two things. One, boy, this is going to be bad on my record. Like the first week on the job, I'm going to lose a boat and a motor from the station. And secondly, Trout Lake's large. I actually thought I was going to die. <laughs> but thank goodness John boats have styrofoam in the seats. And it took me about three hours to swim the thing back to shore, walk it back around, get it back up on the hoist, and get it dry. And nobody ever knew the difference. <laughs> Again, I should have never been an aquatic ecologist, but that day I decided this was really cool. This was for me, and the whole rest of the summer just reaffirmed my love for aquatic ecology. And so, uh, perhaps to my surprise, Michigan State, uh, I don't know what this says of them, was the only school to accept me into a graduate program, and I learned later I was their third choice. So I was unlikely to even get into grad school, but Michigan State needed a master's student in the fisheries and wildlife program to work on a coastal wetland restoration project in the Great Lakes. And this was my first introduction to the Great Lakes, where I worked on uh, restoration of coastal systems uh, in Saginaw Bay. And what we were particularly interested in was all of the wetlands that had been drained and the hydrology uh, from tiles had been tapped so that it was mostly farmland. And the question was simply, if we were to reconnect that hydrologic connectivity, could the organisms get back? Would the plants get there because a the seed bank was still existing in the ag systems? Uh, what organisms required some sort of inoculation, and which organisms required consistent stocking in order to get those communities of organisms back. Uh, and it was during this time that I really fell in love with the topic of restoration ecology. And so for my PhD, I decided I was going to go to the University of Maryland and work with a premier restoration ecologist named Margaret Palmer. Uh, Margaret and I received a grant from the National Science Foundation to test one of the fundamental hypotheses of restoration. It's often called the field of dreams hypothesis. Uh, the field of dreams hypothesis says that if you will simply build the correct habitat type, uh, give it a lot of abiotic heterogeneity, the organisms will simply come from somewhere magically. And once they get there, all of the functions that the ecosystem performs will begin to fall into place and this system will somehow magically restore itself. Um, to test that hypothesis, we went into streams in Appalachia, and we literally destroyed them. So I had an undergrad crew of about 30 individuals who would go into Catoctin Creek. Uh, we would take out every rock bigger than pea gravel, including all the boulders that were hoisting out with uh, giant hoists. Uh, we would then take sprayers, brooms, and our feet and showed that we would reduce all life and all processes by more than 99% in these streams. 
And then we wanted to see whether life would recover when, in fact, you provide a really nice heterogeneous ecosystem, lots of geomorphic variation, lots of flow variation, compared to a system that had exactly the same mean properties but didn't have all of that physical heterogeneity involved in. And we tracked those things for about a couple of years. Uh, one thing that became really imperative, and we published a sequence of papers on, was showing that, that processes actually do follow the field of dreams hypothesis, that processes recover very quickly on their own. Rates of respiration, rates of primary production, rates of decomposition, rates of secondary production. These processes actually recovered on timescales of months and to higher levels in these physical, uh, physically heterogeneous systems. But one thing that was really sort of a pivotal point in my career was the finding that most of the organisms who had originally driven those processes, the hundreds of algal species, invertebrate species, fish species, they didn't recover. And they didn't recover in the time frame of my PhD. Most of the species that recovered and were doing these processes were very sort of what you might call weedy species that were making up for the loss of all the other things that had historically been there. Now, I was publishing these results at the time when people like Dave Tillman, a very prominent, probably the most prominent scientist in the field of ecology, was publishing stuff from Cedar Creek, Minnesota, saying that biodiversity, the variety of plants and animals in an ecosystem, is fundamentally important and crucial for how that ecosystem functions, processes energy and matter, and how productive and efficient it is. And that's not at all what I was seeing in these studies. In fact, Biodiversity was not recovering, and yet functions were. They were completely decoupled from one another. And so this was a point in my career where I took a little bit of a turn from restoration ecology, and I started asking, well, when and why does biodiversity, uh, is it required to make ecosystems process matter and energy efficiently? And when is it not required? And how many organisms, how many species do we need, and which ones, which types do we need? And that's about the time, after a brief postdoc in Wisconsin, that I landed my first job out here on the west coast of the United States, out in UC Santa Barbara. Uh, and I spent the first six years of my career doing experiments in a variety of systems, simulating extinctions, trying to figure out how extinction of species affects processes in ecosystems. And some of my favorite experiments were performed in the high Sierra Nevada streams on the eastern side of the Sierras where we would use these solar panel fence chargers that emitted pulses of 1,800 volts. Uh, and when you manipulate them with resistors, you can actually uh, eliminate and keep certain kinds of fish species, actually different fish species out of the stream or sections of the stream. You can eliminate certain kinds of invertebrates. Uh, and you can tweak the voltage to usually be very species or group specific. And so we would do all of these experiments where we would simulate extinction of a wide variety of organisms in these streams. And then we turn around and measure the metabolism, productivity, and nutrient cycling of the substrates to see how many species did, what did these streams require to keep processing energy and matter, and which ones were most important. Now, the funny thing about these particular experiments is the only way to know whether or not these solar panel chargers were emitting the proper shock uh, was to stick your hand in the stream 20 meters down and walk up slowly <laughs> until you're like, oh, good, yep, it's working. Um, and so we always had to roll dice to see whether the undergrads got that job or whether I got that job. I then spent a little bit of my time working in subtitle kelp beds as well. Uh, there the question was uh, working with the long-term ecological research program to figure out how storm events, which are increasing in frequency along the coastline, impact both the diversity of species as well as the product productivity of kelp beds, particularly as those storms uh, cut them off and wash up a bunch of uh, rack on the beach. Uh, and I even had the fortune of working in coral reefs in Morea, which was by far the most spectacular place I've ever worked, but also by far the most expensive. And I quickly realized I'd never sustain a, a career of research there. Uh, but in those instances, we were looking at how the morphological diversity of different kind of corals could affect uh, hydrodynamics and wave attenuation in ways that would affect and protect the shoreline for the people. Uh, and so I had a little bit of experience there in in uh, salt water. And then after that brief period in uh, Santa Barbara, five years, I moved to the University of Michigan. And I moved my lab here for largely two reasons. One was that the School of Natural Resources, where I'm presently at, is far more disciplinary than the interdisciplinary, excuse me, than the ecology and evolution group that I was in at Santa Barbara. And a lot of my research was leading me towards more interactions with people involved in design and engineering 
and social sciences, and those were interactions that I didn't have at Santa Barbara, but I could have at Michigan. Uh, and then also importantly, my wife has four generations of family, literally a 96-year-old great-grandfather, all still living in the UP. Uh, and as we begun to have kids, it was clear like Santa Barbara wasn't going to work for us, so we had to get back to the Midwest. Now, since I have been here at Michigan, uh, I've been doing a variety of kinds of research, and I'll just give you a flavor for a couple of major projects. Uh, one of my projects is really looking at how uh, the evolution of species diversity can influence the functioning of ecosystems. And it's testing a sequence of hypotheses that uh, date back at least to Darwin, but have become very popular recently. Uh, Darwin proposed that as species diverge on an evolutionary tree and become genetically different from one another, that they also become ecologically different. They evolve into different niches. And as they evolve different niches, niches, interactions like competition decrease. And as they begin to compete less, those species are more likely to coexist. Once you get more coexisting species, an ecosystem becomes more efficient and more productive at capturing a bunch of resources. And this is a hypothesis that has actually begun to make its way pretty prominently into national and international initiatives for conservation and management. Uh, there have been a number of prominent people who have argued you should be able to grind up species, create a molecular phylogeny, and rather than actually doing the hard ecology, just simply from that phylogeny, tell us which ones we need to conserve. So for instance, Dan Faith has suggested that if you conserve two species that are closely related on a phylogeny, you're not going to get a whole lot of function out of those two species. But if you'll conserve two that are really different on the phylogeny, they'll do different things. So he's argued we should maximize phylogenetic diversity rather than species diversity. People like Sharon Strauss have said, well, we should be able to use it for risk assessments, such as invasive species, where the species most likely to invade and cause damage to an ecosystem and take over are the ones that are phylogenetically dissimilar to all of the resident species. Uh, and then most recently, it's been used in ecological restoration to say you can use the molecular phylogeny to tell us which species to restore to give you the maximal ecological function and the least redundancy uh, to save on costs. Well, we got a $2 million grant from the National Science Foundation to work with evolutionary biologists, molecular biologists, uh, and a few other groups of individuals using green algae in lakes across the North America to test that sequence of predictions from Darwin's hypothesis. Uh, we performed a sequence of lab experiments where we manipulated molecular diversity of species and measured all these things, field experiments to back this up, biogeographic surveys, and eventually, we also dove into some new mathematical theory and data syntheses. And universally, across all of the studies shown here, uh, we basically showed that this hypothesis is bunk, uh, at least for uh, North American freshwater algae. It is the best case study I know of right now to experimentally manipulate groups of organisms in a wide variety of systems. And there is zero evidence that species positions on a molecular phylogeny can predict their niche differences, their interactions, their coexistence, or the way they function in an ecosystem. Uh, and in retrospect, there's a variety of reasons why that should make a little bit of sense. There's a lot of convergent evolution. There's a lot of very recent adaptation that isn't necessarily uh, uh, explained by the recent phylogeny. And there's no reason to believe that a modern snapshot of evolution can tell you anything about the biological processes that led to that molecular differentiation, particularly when a lot of the molecular differentiation is from genes that aren't doing anything ecologically in the first place. So we've argued that uh, this hypothesis needs to be rethought and that it shouldn't be used in conservation and management, uh, and that people actually do have to do the hard ecology and figure out what the species do before we say which ones to protect and which ones to restore. Uh, and unfortunately, that brings us back to square one, that you just need to do the hard field work. But that keeps us all on a job. I've recently diverged from questions about how the causes and consequences of biodiversity are related to some applications of biodiversity, most recently to, to the production of algal biofuels. Uh, these are two of my study systems, one in the lab at the University of Maryland data building. This is out at the S. George Reserve with an ongoing experiment we have right now. Um, one of the problems with algal biofuels is that you can grow these absolutely wonderful monocultures of species that will produce about 70% lipid in the lab. But the second you take that really yummy, lipid-rich species and put them in the field, expose them to Mother Nature, they get invaded by other species that are better competitors. They get eaten by herbivores that get in. And basically, everything goes up and then crashes. And it's very hard to keep a stable biofuel system in the lab productive out in the field. 
What we have found is that if you grow consortia of species together, you can decrease the variability of biomass production through time. In other words, species diversity can make things more stable. And in addition, it can decrease the probability of a crop failure where you fall below a threshold amount of production where some energy company like Sapphire would just shut it all down and say, let's start over. And in fact, it's a really substantial amount. If you're growing a monoculture that was good in the lab, you got a 40% of crop, 40% chance of crop failure out in the field. But if you grow six species together, you, grow, you fall under 10% chance of crop failure. And that's a pretty big deal to a grower. Now, one of the reasons that you have this really big decline in the probability of crop failure is because diversity also gives you some insurance that things that would ruin your crop don't get in and don't get established. So we've had a sequence of publications that look at competition among species of algae that you don't want in these cattle tanks uh, where the biofuels are growing and the species that are good for biofuels. I'm just showing one because I thought you'd be interested in it. This is microcystis, which is a common pest species in biofuel production, but it's also obviously a water quality problem all across the world. What we found in a sequence of lab studies and chemostats is that microcystis will grow at a population rate of about 30% per day when it's in the absence of any competition with other species. When you put it in competition with some other species, that drops to about 15% on average. And then when you put it in competition with six resident species of biofuel uh, taxon, they have taken up so much nitrogen out of the water and the competition is so high that you fall below the cell quota required for microcystis to even grow. And microcystis, when you introduce it in, intentionally in these cattle tanks, it will not have positive population persistence and will simply die as a result. So there's some pretty substantial impacts of biodiversity uh, not only on the invasion rates of pest species like microcystis, which may have some implications for HABs, but also a wide variety of other species as well. And then the last thing we've been doing since I got here to the University of Michigan is trying to get out of the freshwater environment and see in general, does biodiversity provide goods and services to humanity? Uh, this was a paper we published just a few years ago uh, where we summarized the results of about 1,700 papers that it looked at how species diversity provides or does or does not provide 32 different goods or services to people on the planet. Uh, and you know, the, there were two take-home messages of this. About 40% of the services that we studied have really good evidence that biodiversity will enhance those services for people. Uh, usually that was from experimental or observational evidence where both the observations and unmanipulated systems and the experiments agreed with one another. Um, and that was sort of the message that one could take away to say policymakers or managers and saying, yeah, biodiversity and its conservation is really critical for a lot of the things that people need uh, from ecosystems. But another take home message from this uh, is that uh, all of this yellow and red and some of it that you don't see here uh, in white that was published in the appendix represent services where biodiversity doesn't do what we thought. And about 60% of the services we studied, there either was no evidence that biodiversity did anything to that service or the evidence was conflicting. Uh, and so the second message was to the scientists themselves saying, you got to be a little bit careful about your claims. Biodiversity is not necessarily good for everything. It's certainly good for some things, uh, but there are certain goods and services where biodiversity may actually be a disservice and actually decrease it. So we need to be a little bit more rigorous in our science. When I'm not doing uh, my research, I'm either teaching or doing service. I teach three classes at the University of Michigan. Uh, one is in conservation biology. I teach with an economist, uh, a class on ecosystem services that teaches graduate students how to place a physical value on nature, usually in a dollar value after we've accounted for an ecological production function. Uh, and then I teach ecological restoration with a landscape architect uh, named Bob Greasy. Um, this past several years, I've also been on the science committee of Future Earth, which is a United Nations initiative to merge all four of its global environmental change programs into a single initiative for sustainability. So the goal of this is to get natural scientists and social scientists, about 4,000 of each, working better together at the level of international policy. The same thing is true for the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is bringing together social and natural scientists uh, to set policy internationally for managing biodiversity and conserving our ecosystem services. 
And then recently I've been leading workshops at the National Social Environmental Synthesis Center, bringing ecologists out together with economists to see if we can put a dollar value on biodiversity for conservation and protection. So to wrap up and summarize the first part of the talk in the introduction, here's what I think I potentially bring to the directorship of, of Siler. So I am by training a community and ecosystems ecologist. Uh, I really like to span that interface between the structure of communities, the biodiversity of communities, and then the functional processes they perform in ecosystems as a whole. Uh, I have a good background in restoration ecology, and then most recently uh, have begun to expand out into looking at what nature does for people and values, both monetary and otherwise. Uh, I have a good deal of experience both at national and international initiatives of forming interdisciplinary teams, trying to get natural scientists, engineers, and social scientists to work much more closely on solving sustainability problems. Uh, and although I'm mostly a freshwater ecologist, you saw from the map that I've spent a good deal of time on the coastline and salt ecosystems as well. So I try to bring a little bit of a marine perspective to my research as well. So that's who I am as an ecologist. And those perspectives are certainly going to influence what I'm thinking about as we move forward together between Glural and Siler. When I was asked about a year ago whether I'd be interested in directing Siler, I had to do a good deal of reflection on the institute and uh, what its history was and how it interacted with Glural and had to do a lot of research about Glural. And um, I want to talk a little bit about some of that reflection. So in case you don't know, Siler's mission is to enhance the quality of Great Lakes research and management by fostering partnerships between NOAA and in this case, academic institutions. So Siler is one of 16 cooperative institutes who are supposed to link NOAA and its research mission and its uh, research task force to other institutions, whether they're academic NGOs or, or some other institution, uh, to help them build up their, their workforce and their capacity to accomplish NOAA's goals. Um, Siler does this by having nine partner institutions that span the Great Lakes uh, that we work with. Siler was formed in 1989 at the University of Michigan, and it has been at the University of Michigan ever since 1989. Uh, we've had uh, five consecutive cooperative agreements with NOAA. One of our jobs is to help Glural build its research capacity, and we do that by funding, at this point, 53 different personnel. Uh, so obviously, as research needs and priorities uh, change for NOAA, they can't consistently hire more and more permanent research staff. And so Siler gives us the flexibility to hire research scientists, research fellows, research staff who may be short-term or on soft money that are fairly typical of uni university hiring processes that aren't necessarily typical of government hiring processes. So at present, we represent about 50% of Glural's entire research staff. Um, our hiring is intended to help Glural build its scientific expertise by filling in some of the gaps that may be needed, or augmenting some of the other areas where we need greater strength. And so uh, these are just a few of the areas where our current uh, distribution of efforts are represented in uh, augmenting nutrient biogeochemistry, biophysical modeling, lake circulation models, climate modeling or systems modeling, uh, and remote sensing. Um, as I was thinking about whether direct Siler um, I was really attracted by what I think is a underlying philosophy between the partnership between Siler, its university partners, and NOAA as the government agency. Um, and this philosophy breaks down what I think was a false dichotomy that was generated mostly back in the 1970s. I still hear it commonly referred to by people of a generation of researchers just prior to mine. You've probably heard it, the dichotomy between basic research versus applied research. Right, where you know, the applied researchers would hurl stones at the people working in the ivory tower, that they're all in their glass towers, they're studying fundamentals and theories that have no applications. Why would we ever want to do that? And then the basic researchers in the ivory tower would hurl stones at those who were doing applied work, that they were uh, inferior scientists for some reason, uh, who didn't understand the fundamentals, who didn't understand the theory. I think we all recognize now that's a really false dichotomy. Nobody goes into an academic position and says, yeah, I want to spend my career being irrelevant. <laughs> like nobody does that. And nobody goes to work for Noah and says, yeah, I'd really like to be a dangerously bad practitioner who doesn't understand theory or practice, right? I want to release cane toads and without understanding the food webs. Um, 
This is a false dichotomy that none of us aspire to anymore. We all aspire to be up as far in the right-hand corner as we can possibly be, where we outstanding science, the very best science that you can get, meets what I call actionable science, the real-world applications where we're solving problems for people. And I think one thing we've realized is that being up here in the right-hand corner requires a partnership between institutions that are complementary to one another and that can build on each other's strengths because we often can't do it all at once. And so I was really attracted to the philosophy that marrying the government agencies like NOAA and the academic institutions like the University of Michigan and its partners could help move us up even farther into this right-hand corner. And I think that philosophy has been espoused in quite a number of projects that have done ongoing in GLURL over the years. So I'll give you just three examples. This one's a bit old, the Eagle Project, uh, which Tom turned me on to, and I, I had to admittedly do my research on this a little bit, but this was back in the late 1970s, uh, where we had a group of people who were looking at episodic events in the Great Lakes, and in particular, how uh, resuspension events in the spring could induce sediment flushes out into the Great Lakes, and then those sediment flushes would ultimately turn around and affect a variety of things in the lake food web ecology, phosphorus dynamics, as well as things like contaminant transport. Uh, this is an example where I think there was an absolutely tremendous uh, partnership between GLURL and Siler, the academic institutions and the government agencies. Uh, this was funded by multiple sources, some of which came from NOAA and others probably would not have been accessible to NOAA without that partnership with the academic institutions. Uh, Eagle represented 17 research institutions, of which eight were partner institutions that were formalized by Siler with academic uh, partnerships around the Great Lakes. Siler obviously had a lot of expertise in the physical modeling. They had a lot of expertise in the modeling of the zooplankton, the benthic dynamics, uh, and they had a ton of expertise, but they also had some things that were missing that had to be filled in by the academic agencies uh, or by Siler facilitating it. The nutrient biogeochemistry, the food web modeling, uh, the hydrology and lake circulation, and then some of the remote sensing were all things that Siler helped bring to the table by forging partnerships between academia and NOAA. Another example would be the Saginaw Bay Multiple Stressors Project. So like pretty much all ecosystems around the world, Saginaw Bay is being exposed to a wide variety of stressors from physical contaminants to nutrient contaminants to invasive species to extinctions, you name it. Uh, but we have this long history of studying all of those stressors individually as if they don't interact and have completely additive effects. Uh, and this is one of the early projects on the Great Lakes to look at how a variety of stressors simultaneously interact to affect water quality and the food webs and the ecosystem health of Saginaw Bay uh, as a whole. Uh, and again, it was a great partnership between NOAA and academic institutions. Uh, there were 12 partners involved in this project. Six of them were academic partners that were fostered by the Siler interaction. Uh, and here were some things that we were able to bring to the table to augment the excellent expertise that was already available in Pluro. And then much more recently, I think the HABs and the Hypoxia project is an ongoing example of a great partnership between Siler and Pluro. Uh, where here, the goal is to come up with much more predictive models using a variety of data sources uh, to understand the environmental drivers of harmful algal blooms and the resulting hypoxia both in Lake Erie as well as in Saginaw Bay, Lake Huron. Uh, and here we've got eight research partners, including four partner institutions from uh, uh, the Siler partnerships. Uh, we're bringing in some expertise on microbial ecology and metagenomics that, that Glural doesn't presently have and is allowing us to extend our inferences a good deal. Overall, I, I could mention probably a dozen more of these kinds of projects. Um, we've got past ones uh, that have been developed, current ones like SOAR. Uh, we've got a new one, Mark Rowe is leading, uh, that is taking hypoxia to a new level. Um, but overall, the take-home message is, is always, it's been a really productive partnership. Uh, so far, the partnership between Siler and Girl has generated $36 million in grant funding. Of that $36 million, $10 million in subcontracts have gone without overhead from the University of Michigan to 26 partner institutions. So 10 million to link GLURL up to academic researchers around the Great Lakes at 26 different institutions. And the University of Michigan that's been increasingly excited about this partnership has thrown in a little bit more than a million over the past couple of years just for good measure. 
774 publications, of which 380 are peer-reviewed papers, co-authored between Gloriel Seiler scientists or their academic partners. That's pretty impressive. That's just since uh, 2007, so that's a, that's a pretty darn good rate of publication. Um, Seiler scientists have been hired by GLURL to meet uh, emerging needs in the GLURL task force. They've been hired by the University of Michigan, so we've begun to forge part better partnerships between academia and NOAA. Uh, and then we've helped train dozens of PhD students, postdoctoral fellows, and hundreds of summer fellows who we hope will really get turned on like I did back when I was a kid from Arizona working in Wisconsin, and will really want to work in aquatic ecology and form your task force of the future. So I think we've had a very productive partnership to date, but we certainly can't get complacent because the Great Lakes are facing uh, even greater challenges than they faced in the last decade. So let's talk a little bit about the future and anticipate what's coming up and how we might be able to do even better. So NOAA has made clear what its overarching goals are, uh, and I think many of these overarching goals have been reflected in the strategic research agenda for GLURL itself. So NOAA has said, as we face these new challenges uh, across the entire U.S., first of all, we're going to have to do a much better job of integrating disciplines so that we get a much more holistic systems perspective rather than just a natural sciences perspective. Obviously, climate change is a high priority. So after we integrate and get a systems perspective, we need to really be able to predict climate change as well as focus on its impacts on society. We said, and to do that, we need to forecast the extreme, both the weather, the weather events and the water-related events uh, that society is going to face. Uh, we need to have much better and much more integrated modeling so that we could manage these complex socio-natural systems. And then lastly, we need to prepare people for the unpredictable events that NOAA doesn't yet have the expertise or the modeling capabilities to predict their occurrence on. Uh, we need to make communities resilient against the unexpected. Well, if these are the NOAA priorities, I think there's five things we're going to need, and I think Siler's in a position to perhaps help fill some gaps in GLURL uh, so that we can meet these challenges for NOAA as a whole. So if we're going to integrate disciplines for a systems perspective, we obviously need much more interdisciplinary teams. Now, we don't have to raise hands, but I'm guessing if I asked how many in here are natural scientists versus social scientists, it would be overwhelmingly dominated by natural scientists because GLURL and NOAA as a whole don't necessarily have a long history of supporting the social sciences. But I think this is an area where Siler uh, can really help out. So I'll just give you one example. There was an executive order that came down just a few months ago from uh, President Obama saying that all government agencies must now consider the valuation of ecosystem services in their management decisions. So these are the goods and services that the Great Lakes provide to society. Some of these can be monetary values that you would get in commercial fisheries. Some of this can simply be other forms of valuation, public health, uh, human mental well-being. Well, we're well positioned in GLURL to do a really good job on the ecological production functions that give us goods and services. We're not all that well positioned to translate those into economic valuation because we don't have a lot of interactions with environmental economists and we don't have a lot of interactions with public health officials or, or with the human behavioral sciences. But this is where Siler can help expand that workforce with those at the academic institutions that can fill those gaps uh, until the time that NOAA approves a little bit more hiring for certain kinds of individuals. If we are going to predict climate change and its impacts on society, we've got to actually do a better job of including society and the people who would potentially suffer uh, those potential problems. And it really requires a fundamental mindset in the way we do and translate science. This is the historical mindset that some agency, government or otherwise, says here's some funding for something we think is important. The people in academia and the government agencies do it, and somehow it trickles out to societal benefit because magically they read your papers and understand them and somehow interpret them. Uh, and I think everybody knows now that this historical model of the way we engage stakeholders and disseminate knowledge just doesn't work. Uh, and increasingly, there have been calls for the co-design and the co-production of knowledge where the in-use stakeholders, the ones who are going to suffer from rising water levels and have their houses ruined, uh, the individuals who are going to experience drought, 
are sitting at the table with us from the very beginning, coming up with the joint framing of questions, defining the research, implementing the research, all the way to disseminating the results in ways that an end user can actually use that material to better their lives. Now, one of the biggest challenges as we do this is to not only build trust between those who are doing the research, Glural Siler, and those stakeholders, but also to ensure continuous engagement of those stakeholders so that we can get all the way around this feedback loop and work together. And I see Siler as being one of the linchpins to engage stakeholders uh, and have them working between Siler and Glural to ensure continuous engagement uh, so that they can be involved in the joint framing to the dissemination of our results. All right, if we get people together, our next step is we're going to have to forecast. We're going to have to predict these extreme events that those individuals are going to be facing. Now, my perception is that Glural and NOAA in general are excellent about developing technology and observing systems and monitoring platforms so that we can get the high resolution spatial or temporal data uh, that we can use to predict and forecast some events like tipping points, thresholds, nonlinearities. But what the academics have been particularly good about is developing the mathematical theory, the models, the indices, and the statistical tools that use that data and tell us, can we forecast that that tipping point is coming? So for example, one of Seiler's colleagues at the University of, uh, of Wisconsin-Madison is a leading expert in trying to use these semi-variograms and autocorrelation between measurements of chlorophyll on lakes to see whether a shift in the variant spectra can tell you within a couple days that you're going to hit an alternative stable state where you're never going to reverse phosphorus loads and you're never going to reverse eutrophication in that particular lake. Uh, Steve Carpenter has been a real leader in resilience theory and the detection of alternative stable states. And I think Siler can play a key role between getting together GLURL and NOAA, which is excellent in technology and observing systems, with the academic community who are very good in the fundamental theory of alternative stable states. And we make sure that those two are talking together so that our observing, monitoring systems, and technology are actually detecting the indices that we need to forecast change in the near future. We're going to need a lot better quantitative skills as a whole. Now, I think our physical scientists are doing pretty well at this. If you were to ask uh, the average person at the recent ice symposium, how is a three degree warming of water temperature in Lake Superior going to affect ice cover? They actually can give me a pretty good first approximation, but if you ask some of our fisheries biologists or plankton biologists, how much is a three degree warming going to affect the production of zooplankton and ultimately the feeding of fish, the most common response is, it's really complex uh, and it's all context dependent, right? You don't actually get a number. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it is more complex than physics, so we got to give you a little bit of credit for that. Two, many of these aspects of biology and to many extent the social sciences are just not as far along in their science as the physics have been. They haven't been running as long with as much funding. But I think a third and really important thing that Siler can help on uh, is that many people in our field, biological sciences, the social sciences, are not trained quantitatively. Uh, they're not trained beyond simple statistics to actually do the mathematical modeling based on first principles of physics that can give us those predictive models. Now, we've been really fortunate here where we've got people like Mark and Hyung Yan who are physical modelers that can help us predict biology, but I would say that they're more of a rarity in the workforce than they are the norm. And we actually need to do a much better job of the biological and social sciences being quantitatively trained so that in a decade, NOAA has a workforce that can actually advance that predictive modeling in sync with the physical modeling. Uh, and I think Siler is in a position to potentially help with some of those improved quantitative skills. And then lastly, if we're going to prepare for those unforeseeable events that we can't yet predict based on our modeling, then we need to have rapid response systems. We need to have funding mechanisms. We need to have teams. Uh, we need to have the research capacity to get people out there very fast within a matter of hours to days when, in fact, we have a major storm event. You can't predict major storm events if you don't capture their dynamics with the data. It's impossible. 
you cannot predict uh, the consequences of this if we respond to the oil spill or we respond to the Toledo water crisis or the Flint water crisis months after it happens, right? And we certainly don't want Virginia Tech to be the one that responds to this stuff on the Great Lakes, right? We want NOAA and we want the University of Michigan and its partners to be the first responders to our local problems on the Great Lakes. And so we need to somehow formalize much more rapid response systems to get people out there, first responders, immediate data so that we can improve our models and our forecasting. Well, how are we going to do that? Let me give you some ideas of what we're hoping to accomplish in Siler over the next five years as we face a recompetition uh, of the Siler bid for a cooperative institute. First of all, we're looking right now and talking with our current consortium partners, uh, looking to build a stronger, perhaps bigger, perhaps smaller, but certainly a stronger group of consortium partners who are much more invested in NOAA's mission. Um, we're going to expand it and complement it with some affiliate institutions, NGOs, businesses, a variety of other organizations uh, that span all of the Great Lakes. We do really well right now. Uh, on Michigan, Huron, and uh, Erie. We don't do particularly well on Superior and Ontario, and we want to cover all of the Great Lakes. Our hope is that we can convince our partners to not only reduce IDC rates to at least off-campus costs so that NOAA gets a bigger bang for its buck wherever it does research, but we're hoping to also get them to agree to shared infrastructure such as vessel time around the Great Lakes. So if you have a rapid response problem, uh, you can potentially get on a boat anywhere and respond to it. We currently run our Summer Fellows Program, which is typically a group of 8 to 12 uh, undergraduates and graduate students who come in and do internships, uh, partly to help out so with ongoing research, but partly to hopefully stimulate some training and some interest in becoming the next workforce in NOAA. Uh, we're hoping to expand that. Over the past five years, we have very opportunistically funded postdoctoral fellows or graduate fellows uh, usually when there's some slop money left over in the NOAA budget, we, it looks promising, although I can't give you a guarantee yet, but it looks promising that the University of Michigan is going to be willing to pony up this money so that we can have at least two permanent postdoc positions, possibly one uh, long-term fellows program, and several master's projects per year. Uh, Michigan is talking about infusing a little bit over $200,000 in programmatic funding to ensure that we have some uh, benefits to offer partners to do Great Lakes research in association with GLURL. Uh, in addition, we're in the works right now to get enough money that we can fund several rapid grants per year. The idea is that if there's an emergency on the Great Lakes or that involves the Great Lakes, a harmful algal bloom, a big storm event, a pipeline burst, a Flint water crisis, um, that we can offer relatively small amounts of money, but we can do that in a time span of two to three days with internal review so that you have funds to immediately be the first responder with your postdoc or graduate student to get out there and get the data needed even as you're trying to apply for funding to a much more uh, substantial uh, group like NOAA, NSF, EPA. But we want to be the ones that ensure that you have the funding to get someplace you need quickly to get the data so that we don't lose those opportunities. Uh, we're also beginning to formalize and fund a variety of working groups and summits per year. The working groups are more substantial. Uh, they're usually a smaller number of people, maybe 10 to 12 individuals working together for five days on a data-driven exercise to try and solve a Great Lakes problem that includes academic researchers, government researchers, and the policymakers that can do something about it. Summits are shorter. Summits are intended to get together partners and end users of information for two uh, days at a time to summarize what we know about a topic and to set an agenda for research over the next decade. Uh, and we just started these summits this year. We've actually held two of them so far. The first one, uh, which was uh, partly led by Drew Gronwald, uh, was trying to meet NOAA's mission of hydrologic modeling and forecasting. Uh, it brought together 36% of participants from four government agencies, six universities, two NGO, I'm sorry, two institutes, an NGO, and two businesses, including one from the shipping industry to see if we could use the extreme El Nino event in Lake Superior to refine our models, both our physical models and our biological models, because here's this opportunistic extreme event to test how well are we doing with our modeling, and if we're doing poorly, 
let's use that in El Nino event to refine the models and improve them and their forecasting ability. Uh, Drew, was that successful? I think, I think it was an excellent summit. People loved it. That was held in May. In June, we held a summit on Great Lakes Ecosystem Services to complement Glural's goal of ecosystem dynamics. We brought 28 participants together from three government agencies, nine universities, three institutes, an NGO, and two economic think tanks, uh, a wide variety of people to say, how do we merge the natural and social sciences so that we can predict the goods and services that uh, Great Lakes ecosystems provide to society, that we can quantify them properly, and so we can predict how they're going to change in the future as we have things like climate change. And then we have one coming up in September that uh, Tom Jahingen's going to lead on advancing Great Lakes technology. And they're in the uh, process of putting that together and deciding who the participants are. This year, we didn't have open calls for the summits. We put them together ourselves internally based on some discussion with our executive board uh, and our internal team at Siler. But in the future, starting next year, we're going to hold open competitions for one summit and working group in each of NOAA's themes every year so that we can help advance the research on those themes. So look for those open calls. We've got enough money where we think we can bring 20 to 30 people together at a time to make some progress on uh, either data-driven exercises or forecasting and envisioning exercises. And then we're rapidly expanding out our list of educational and, oper uh, and outreach opportunities. Uh, and we're particularly interested in connecting uh, to some groups that maybe NOAA's hands are tied in connecting themselves to and lobbying, but this is something that Siler can potentially do and that the academic universe, uh, institutions are free to do. We're free to lobby with the politicians for the importance of Great Lakes research, um, as long as we're not representing NOAA per se. Uh, we're free to lobby locally for the importance of GLURL and Siler and the University of Michigan and to try to solicit funding. Uh, in ways that maybe NOAA can't necessarily do. Uh, and so we're beginning to ramp up uh, with some additional funding from the University of Maryland, some of those efforts, uh, and we're hoping they'll be fruitful in connecting us to some partners uh, that we haven't necessarily been able to connect to in the past. So this is where I think Siler is going and what I hope it can help with. If this is NOAA's charge of integrating disciplines, we can help form those interdisciplinary teams and give a bit of a workforce and some scientific expertise that perhaps isn't currently represented in GLURL. Uh, we can engage stakeholders more consistently uh, and be the liaison between GLURL and those stakeholders. Uh, we can link GLURL and its monitoring and technology systems to some of the academic partners who are developing the theory on how to actually use that data. Uh, we can help build a workforce with improved quantitative skills with our training programs, our summits, and our working groups. And hopefully we can provide some means of very rapid response for the GLURL researchers and the academic researchers so we catch those events that are absolutely vital to improving our models and forecasting into the future. So that's my summary of what the partnership between GLURL and Siler has done in the past. And I think it's been an incredibly fruitful partnership. And I've given you at least my vision of five things where I think we need to go together over the next decade to improve our science and forecasting for the Great Lakes. But I present this to you not in a manner that's intended to be top down saying this is what I'm going to do. I present this to you as the starting point of discussion. And I invite you to come see me either in my office on the campus at the University of Michigan or I'll be sharing an office here with Mary Ogdahl who's our program manager. I invite you to come see me today or any other time. Let's set up an appointment. Let's talk about what you think uh, is important in this relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, we can entertain a few questions in the room, and I invite uh, people that are on the webinar can type in their questions, and we'll read them out. But uh, we'll start in the uh, in the room here. Fred? Yeah. When you destroy the stream. Yeah. <laughs> They were 200 meter reaches, and we destroyed um, six of them in total, three for upstream controls and three for downstream. Um, so it took us about six days, and the, you know, the hardest part was reduce, um, getting the boulders out that were the size of this chair and about a ton where you had to actually have winches and about 18 undergrads lifting them and putting them on the side of the bank. 
Um, and then we had to tell them, okay, now it's time to put it back in. <laughs> it, was, it was a crazy project. I'll never do anything like it again. Yes? Um, not anytime soon, it would be my understanding. So um, uh, there's a couple of technological bottlenecks. We've actually reached the point where we get enough yield in outdoor ponds. We don't have a means to keep them stable through time, so that's a big bottleneck, and we don't have um, the stuff to process them, particularly for algae. How do you get algae out of the water? It's surprisingly hard. You either have to centrifuge it, which is hugely ener energy expensive, or you have to float it or sink it, uh, which that technology doesn't really exist well so far. Right now, the production is at about $25 a barrel, says Sapphire, um, so it needs to come down by an order of magnitude to be competitive. Uh, I think the National Academy of Science has projected if algal biofuels stay as one of the major biofuels, and we're always competing with corn and switchgrass and converting all of the U.S. to uh, you know, a big switchgrass field, uh, but if it stays on as one of the forms of biofuel, it's probably a decade to two decades out before you're going to get in your car. That's the best guess. Okay, um, just want to remind everybody, hopefully it doesn't need reminding, that we have the picnic uh, starting in about a half hour. You might be a little slow uh, getting the first burgers and dogs off the grill. Um, but please come out and join us for a picnic, uh, a little social interaction, and then I Brad has a number of uh, meetings scheduled for this afternoon. If you didn't get on that list, please you know, individually find a time to come and talk to them. Talk to me, email me, or talk to Mary. We'll find a time to meet and talk. Thank you. Steve Cole, I'm with the Great Lakes Commission. Steve, good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Congratulations yeah. on the appointment. Thank you very much. Do you know much about the Great Lakes Commission? I, not much. Not much, okay. No, I mean, so, not much other than what's on the website. Right, so we're a facilitating organization with states and provinces. I'm going to talk about you know, how we reach out in your area and reach out in the community. It's like a very good thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have a connection to the United States and the states and provinces. May ultimately help out. I know, I know you're, you know, you're, you're new into this. And, uh, right, right. You know, every, like an onion. Every time I fill up a layer, I realize there's another layer of organization. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, so. Um, but the Great Lakes Commission, we want to know a little bit more about yeah. some other. Yeah. Well, let me give you my card, and, and you know, this is the wrong time to get into some great detail. But, uh, can I call you at some point though? Please do. Please put a bill and just say, how can we next? Exactly. And, um, and a couple of my colleagues from other programs as well. Uh, okay. I think we might have a conversation. That'd be great. So, we'd love it. So we'll get Tom, Mary, and myself on the phone with you.